Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Datascape. The brand new Kingdom Hearts, co I cannot speak. The brand new Kingdom Hearts podcast on the block. Look at me, the first episode, I'm already messing up the intro. We'll get used to it though. You guys will get very, very used to this intro. Um, I've been wanting to do a podcast for a while, like a really, really, really long time. Um, but I just never, I guess, had the urge to go ahead and do it. Now, for today's episode, it's going to be just me, but the plans for the podcast are we're going to do a mixture of both, one episode for me, one episode with the guest, and we'll kind of interchange between the two back and forth, depending on, you know, the topics, the week, things of that nature. Uh, the current plan is I want to do two times a week, but at least one, uh, depending on people's schedules, because, you know, with guests and things, sometimes guests dip out, sometimes guests, you know, have things they have to do in their personal life, they end up bailing. Uh, so to adjust for those things, we'll at least have one episode a week with just me. Thank you to everyone who has been excited for the podcast. I know I've teased it quite a bit over on Twitter. Additionally, I've also teased it quite a bit over on the YouTube channel as well in the community tab. And I've mentioned it here and there as well. But hello to everyone in the chat. Um, the way the podcast is going to work, the goal for this podcast is I kind of wanted a place where I could just, I guess, speak my mind, kind of similar to the discussion live streams we normally do that we have late at night uh, that I used to do very frequently, but we don't stream as much nowadays. So the podcast will kind of replace or will kind of be the consistent form of streaming that I plan on doing moving forward. Um, a nice place to talk about all the Kingdom Hearts news that I don't always make videos about, all the Kingdom Hearts discussions I don't always make videos about, uh, and just anything really Kingdom Hearts gaming related that I find to be interesting, entertaining to talk about, some nice back and forth, and you know, we'll just have a little discussion about it over here. Uh, now, as you guys can see, we have a little, we have a decent little layout here. There's a couple of things missing, but that's mostly because it's the first episode, so I don't want to do too much promotional stuff. Uh, usually, there would be some other things uh, below or above that I would have prepared, but you guys will see those things in due time. You will gradually see the podcast upscale both in quality and visuals for those of you who aren't just listening. Um, but for today's discussion... The title of the video is Kingdom Hearts is Entering a New Era. So, I guess a good place to begin with that is we are in a new era of Kingdom Hearts, guys. I mean, Kingdom Hearts 4 is on the horizon. You won't need me to tell you that. It's been almost a year since we last saw Kingdom Hearts 4, which is kind of crazy to think about now. I mean, it's crazy how fast time flies by in just a year. Like... Shoot, a year ago, like, we were over here doing countdown days, countdown live streams, like, nine days till, eight days till, five days till, like, the trailer came out, because we knew we were going to be getting something at the 20th anniversary event, at least hopefully, right? Um, and now it's almost been a year since then, and we don't really have any additional information. We got a couple of interviews that came out with series director Tetsuo Nomura, some scary comments as well recently that we'll talk about a little bit in the live stream today. Um, and aside from that, we really don't have any new major info regarding Kingdom Hearts 4. I mean, we know that the game is going to mostly take place in Quadrom. Maybe not mostly, but it's going to... A bulk of the game is going to take place in Quadrom. It's going to be treated as sort of a hub world for Sora. Something we haven't really seen too much in the Kingdom Hearts series, aside from worlds like Traverse Town, Twilight Town, Radiant Garden. You could say those are kind of our hub worlds, or even the world never was in 358 by two days. But... It seems like Quadrom is going to be a little different this time around. The key wordage that Nomura used in an interview in the past that I would reference here is he said the term, we're going to be experiencing Sora's day by day. And that specifically is very interesting because that implies that Sora is going to be waking up, going to sleep in this world. He has his own little apartment, which apparently is an actual thing in the game. Nomura went as far as to say that there's going to be more stuff in the apartment it looked kind of empty in the trailer but it's going to be filled with a bunch of other things maybe you'll be able to customize it and whatnot he didn't say that part but that's my interpretation it's possible who knows 
new era, scary, time flies, the moment I saw Strelitzia. Yeah, I, I remember seeing Strelitzia in the trail, and I was just like, whoa, that's <laughs> that's the Union Cross girl. I mean, I already know who she is, so I don't have to call her Union Cross girl. But the, I know that's what a lot of other people are thinking. Like, Strelitzia being in a mainline Kingdom Hearts game and being in the first reveal trailer for Kingdom Hearts 4, that implies she's going to have a big role to play in the future. Which confirms a lot of my thoughts that I've been having for quite some time regarding Shalitzia's role, Shalitzia's presence in the Kingdom Hearts franchise. Like, the entire story of Union Cross, a lot of people like to say she's some character that doesn't matter too much, or some character that, I mean, well, she matters, obviously, but some character that just isn't that important. She doesn't have as much screen time, so, like, what's the point in, like, talking about her and, like, you know, theorizing, calling her a good character, whatever. I've often said she's a very great character in the series. Even though she has very little screen time, I feel like the little screen, the little screen time she got, uh, she showed us a lot of her personality, and she showed us just... I don't know. Like, I, I feel like that character just has a lot of... I don't know if depth's the right word I would use, but maybe something close to that. Like, the entire plot of the world, the story of Union Cross around by her, every plot point moves kind of because of her, or like, her death is a very big thing that moves plot points just forward in general. And apologies if you hear random background noise. I have other people in the house, siblings and whatnot, so if it comes through on the mic, I apologize, but it is what it is. I really hope we get some new information on Kingdom Hearts 4 since the real show will be a year old on Monday. Let that be our next topic. Let me drink some water right quick. So, I feel like when it comes to news, I'm a little worried. I'm not going to lie. I, well, I don't know if worry is the right term because I wouldn't say I'm sad or super eagerly awaiting news. At the end of the day, the game will come out when it comes out. It's very different from the Kingdom Hearts 3 times where I used to sit back and I would be waiting like so desperately for any new drop crumb of information. And while admittedly, I will take whatever I get. Do not get me wrong. That does not mean if I see news, I'm going to be hyped. I'm going to be excited. I'll be the first person to probably start talking about it on YouTube or one of the first people like that I will be all over it right however it's different times I'm a lot older um, I understand that like game development takes time I understand that I just want the game to be the best it could possibly be and more than that even I think what helps me be more content with waiting is I enjoyed like the last couple years of Kingdom Hearts games we've gotten. I've loved the story of Dark Road and Union Cross both together. I think they're some of the best stories we've ever gotten in Kingdom Hearts. And it is a shame they are trapped on a mobile game. It is very criminal. Um, but I also enjoyed Melody of Memory. I do want to do more for that community and I want to... I want to promote and support that game a lot more. I wish the game got support a lot more by Square itself, uh, but that's another topic. I love Remind, I love Cage 3. I, I don't know. Like, I feel like the last couple of Kingdom Hearts games were extremely, like, fun or good. So, I don't know. I'm kind of content with, like, playing those games until the next game comes out. Um, we also have Kingdom Hearts on PC. We have a modding community. If you are one of the people who are lucky enough to be able to play the games on PC, you have a good enough PC that can run the games, which it, it doesn't take that much to run the games. Maybe 3 and 0 0.2, but uh, for the other games, 1, 2, BBS, Dream Drop, um, I think most PCs can run those nowadays, at least most gaming-oriented PCs for sure. I'm just happy. Like, I'm happy at the state Kingdom Hearts is at. Like, I feel like it's more accessible than it's ever been. We have these PS4 collections going on sale for, like, dirt cheap, like, every couple of months, couple of weeks in some areas. I mean, I'm just talking about what I see off of Twitter or what I see with my own eyes. There's probably places, like, where you guys live, where you guys frequent, that have tons of sales and there's tons of deals for Kingdom Hearts games for the all-in-one bundle. And you could play the entire series, like 10-something games, plus, like, I don't know, like a bunch of stories, just basically for the price of one game. 
shoot, uh, ba barely the price of one game, even half the price of one game. <laughs> I've seen the all one collection go on sale for like 30 bucks before, and games are like $70 now, so that's less than half. It's this is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, it's entirely possible for there to be a new trailer or development update for KH4 or Missing Link in the summer. Missing Link is something I'm kind of... I, I don't know what words to use to describe it. I'm hyped for Missing Link, but I need to see a lot more of it. I'm not as hyped for the gameplay of Missing Link, but I will admit I did, in fact, see some of the leaks that happened. I apologize. I'm sorry that there were leaks square, but look, I I don't know. I'm, I'm a Kingdom Hearts fan, just idly standing by on the sidelines. I If, if there was an opportunity to see him... I was going to see him. Anyways, I saw some of the leaks regarding Missing Link. I'm not going to talk in detail about what the leaks uh, had or anything. Now, now that I really analyzed them myself, so I don't think I could really accurately tell you, but the game looks a lot better than I anticipated. Like, the gameplay actually does look a lot more grounded and, I guess, fluent than I originally imagined. Um, graphics also look a little bit better than I imagined they would as well. So I, I am a little bit more excited for that part of the game because uh, I always have been wanting to do like multiplayer and just big community events for Kingdom Hearts because so many Kingdom Hearts games have multiplayer games or some multiplayer function or some community element that you know you can share and create and do stuff with like data greeting for example gummy ships in cage three how you can have gummy ship I've seen people host gummy ship contests and stuff before. Uh, the multiplayer in cage through modding, but even outside of modding, you've had games like Days have have multiplayer. You've had Mirage Arena have multiplayer. Melodia Memory has multiplayer. Uh, games like Union Cross, Dark Road. There's so many of these Kingdom Hearts games that have community slash multiplayer elements, and I, it, it's crazy that like a lot of them just either don't work normally anymore, or just aren't supported and therefore just don't have any consistent fan bases behind them and it's surprising considering how loyal the kingdom hearts fan base is to all their games i mean you have we have people like you guys in the live stream like watching a kingdom hearts podcast like it, it, crazy right like a whole kingdom hearts podcast right that's insane we have people hundreds of thousands millions of people waiting talking about kingdom hearts like probably every day across every different social media platform and they just haven't gone all the way with multiplayer like it feels like when it comes to multiplayer for kingdom hearts they always dip like they dip their toes in the water but they never dive in so i don't know it's always like they're always like inching towards these multiplayer elements but never fully commit and it's just unfortunate i feel like the future of kingdom hearts it's going to be very bright. Hopefully. <laughs> if that statement that Mura made has anything to say about it, depending on however you interpret that, but because we have no confirmation on that, I won't talk too deeply about that yet at this point anyways. I will spike later on a little bit more later. I feel like the future, though, is looking very bright. I feel like Kingdom Hearts is in a position better than it's ever been. Not just for people who have been fans of the series for all these years, but even for fans who, you know, maybe fell out of the series, maybe didn't like Kingdom Hearts 3, maybe didn't like some of the um, games that came out after Kingdom Hearts 2 or whenever. Whenever you start falling out the series, I feel like the series does a good job at always roping people back in, bringing people back in, and I feel like Kingdom Hearts 4 is just that game that is going to do a lot not only for the people who didn't like some other games but it's going to do a lot for people who have been recurring fans as well and really reward those people who have been following the mobile game stories following union cross following dark road following the key saga to every single piece of dialogue analyzing it speculating over it theorizing over it. so we made a theory video about the master of masters last week still one of the most talked about characters in the kingdom hearts series and we barely even get to see the man like, I think that Kingdom Hearts 4 is going to really reward those people. And that's something that I'm I'm excited about. And it, we've seen with reaction commands and um, just from the talks that the interviews Nomura has been in, it seems like they're going to be trying to appeal a little bit more. Remind as well. Remind, you can add on to that from the criticisms they got from Remind. Um, it seems like they are going to try and make the combat to 
people's liking as well. Not that Kingdom Hearts 3's combat was bad, in my opinion, uh, but I know there's a lot of people who don't prefer it, so they're, they might be going for more of a mixture of styles between what Kingdom Hearts 3 did right and what some people love from the other games, because it's always cool to bring back new mechanics or bring back old mechanics, um, reinvent them, and like I don't kind of see them in a new light. I agree, Kingdom Hearts set itself up to be extremely open and can go anywhere at once while maintaining a mass audience. I completely agree. Like, the series' ability to constantly push the pedal, like, move things forward, whether it's with worlds, with its story, or with its characters, I really think is just... It's amazing to see out of a series that I love so much. Of course, you have the ongoing story that we've all just loved and cherished for years and years. But even outside of that, like, this series is constantly, like, different in every single game. Whether it's for better or for worse. I mean, from games like Kingdom Hearts 1 to Chain of Memories to 2 to Dream Drop and BBS to Dream Drop to, like, K3 or... All these other games, I don't know, I feel like the series does a very good job of reinventing, at reinventing its combat, reinventing its the way it decides to try and tell its story, the way it approaches worlds and is constantly trying to upscale and innovate them. Obviously, some games do better, some games do worse, but I often say this to people in calls, but I feel like, I feel like nowadays more than ever, especially through you guys, you guys have like opened my eyes to this a lot, because I remember back in the day, I used to definitely be a type of person where if you said your favorite Kingdom Hearts game was anything outside like the number of titles, I'd be like, huh, maybe BBS. BBS like made sense a little bit because a lot of people got into Kingdom Hearts through BBS, but I feel like there was a period where if you where if you like were a fan of games outside of the number of titles, it was kind of like looked as bizarre, but I don't really see it that way anymore especially as I've grown an audience on this platform, especially as I've gone to interact with just way more Kingdom Hearts fans over time, and just hearing everyone's opinions, especially after all the Kingdom Hearts 3 debates and learning about everyone's different opinions, I, I feel like it's, it's not that surprising to hear any Kingdom Hearts game be someone's favorite. I mean, like, I've heard it all. Like, I've seen people who have Chain of Memories as their favorite game. I've even seen some people have Recode in their top three. I've seen some people have, like, Dream Drop as their favorite. Two, one, three, obviously. It, it's just, I don't know. Like, I feel like every Kingdom Hearts game can be someone's favorite. I truly do. It doesn't mean every Kingdom Hearts game is the best, or that doesn't mean every Kingdom Hearts game is, like, I don't know, that doesn't mean, like, we need games modeled after Days or Birth by Sleep or Dream Drop Forever. Um, I feel like the best option is always something that appeals to everyone equally, as hard as that definitely is. Uh, getting as close to that as possible is generally, I feel like, the goal of a lot of games, a lot of audiences. Um, I feel like most Kingdom Hearts games are at least decent enough, good enough for everyone to be somebody's favorite. I don't know. That that might have like sounded weird, but it a lot of a lot of cage games are good. <laughs> Me personally, I think almost all of them are good. I think the only Kingdom Hearts game I'm a little like iffy on is Recoded. Recoded is like good, but it has things that I'm a little like iffy about. We could talk about that. We could talk about that in another episode though. Let's hope the combat is flushed out and not just flashy moves for cage for. I agree, but I agree, but I also think Kingdom Hearts has kind of always been flashy, right? Like, we've always, always had flashy moves in Kingdom Hearts. Like, even in KH1, like, I would say KH1 is kind of flashy. Not in comparison to 2 or 3. It's not as fast. But in terms of just being flashy and, like, somewhat fast, like, high-speed action, um, especially late-game KH1, I feel like Kingdom Hearts has always been that way. It's always been about, like, looking cool, and it's always been about doing, like, the flashy move, um, maybe they've went a little too far with it, perhaps in three, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, I, you could definitely make an argument that Kingdom Hearts three is just as flashy as a game like Kingdom Hearts two, or like a game like BBS is just as flashy as other Kingdom Hearts games. I feel like they're all flashy. I genuinely do. But I know when people say flashy, they don't just mean flashy. They don't just mean like the look, how the animation looks. I think what a lot of people mean in like a deeper way is how the combat 
is how the combat feels they want a combat system that feels flashy but also feels like practical and cool and precise precision and that might be something that cage three uh didn't do as much the precision side of it they brought that back a little bit with remind but kingdom Hearts 3 was very much so made for you to just beat the game they really wanted you to beat the game like kingdom hearts 3 they did not want you to have a hard time being in the game unless you absolutely wanted to like with level one not releasing crypto later they just wanted everyone to finish and beat kingdom hearts 3 which was an inter interesting approach i mean i think every dev wants people to beat their games obviously but it's just character was kind of easy at launch like it was like even proud mode was easy now i've seen people who had who have had difficulty with kingdom hearts 3 uh but as a person who's played like most of the kingdom hearts games leading up to 3 um like before 3 came out playing almost all the games like that that game just didn't challenge me that much like i played proud and i've had multiple friends i've seen even other creators who played character for the first time they put on no exp halfway through the game because they felt like they were just like game was sponging everything and that's kind of how three was it gave you so 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 much luckily though they did release crit and they did release uh they did they would release like pro code and things so if you want to make kingdom hearts 3 hard for yourself there are plenty of options you have just as many options as other kh games and i think it's critical mode's actually really fun i would say it's it probably has one of the best critical modes in the series definitely top three i i don't know how it would rate all the other critical modes if i had to put them on a best to worst list but i would definitely say threes is up there for sure it would be like two three and maybe bbs because bbs crit's really fun but i don't know like i feel like critical mode in k3 is really good game Hearts 3 made fighting mobs boring i actually think the opposite i feel like mob fights in three were actually really fun now i do get what you're saying though like you were able to just damage sponge through most of the mob fights but i kind of i don't I, I don't know i don't know if i want mob fights to be super duper difficult because sometimes when mob fights are difficult it almost feels unfair in some games but it depends on how you design it of course right it's just mob fights in three they felt a little bit more intuitive than other mob fights in like the games well that's not fair to say i think twos definitely has the most intuitive mob fights because of reaction commands it made every interaction feel unique with reaction commands that's something about two that you just can't it's hard to replicate unless you just bring reaction commands back and i think it's something that makes kh2 extremely special in three you're definitely able to just mow through a lot of mob fights but i feel like the scale of the mob fights made it really fun like kh3 kind of made they they put they gave you a lot more mobs to fight in to try and counteract like how quickly you were able to defeat them that's that's kind of what kh3 did but I feel like mob fights aren't really meant to be super difficult, especially by end game in Kingdom Hearts games. Like most of the time, they're not going to be difficult unless you're playing on a higher difficulty, like level one crit. But even then, you if you're like playing Kingdom Hearts on crit or level one, you're probably skipping most mob fights because you're probably just doing like a boss rush. You're probably just uh, trying to do a challenge run, so you're trying to see how fast you can beat the game or trying to see how good you can do at this boss fight at this level. Maybe at most you're doing mob fights to collect materials to get things like ultimate weapon for your run or get things like other keyblades or to synthesis items, things like that. When do I think Kingdom Hearts 4 will release? I believe Kingdom Hearts 4 will release. I was going to say end of next year, but I'm kind of I don't know. Like I I'm so uncertain about where Kingdom Hearts 4 is. Like, I don't know whether the game is still early in development or if it's, like, halfway through development. I don't know if it's almost done. Like, it's definitely not almost done. I feel like they're waiting a long time for Kingdom Hearts 4 to show it off again because they know that, like, they probably shouldn't have shown it at the 20th anniversary, but they had to show something for the 20th anniversary. Like, if we only got Missing Link for the 20th anniversary, I think a lot of Kingdom Hearts fans would have been like, oh... Okay, and don't get me wrong, a lot, there's a lot of Union Cross fans, there's a lot of people who love games like Missing Link and love, like, the stories of those games. I'm one of them, but 
in terms of like the that casual audience in terms of like that general kingdom hearts audience like even beyond the casual audience like even people like who are hardcore kingdom hearts fans there's plenty of them who don't like follow or like read every piece of union cross lore or dark road lore no matter how good it is this is they can't get past the fact that it's a mobile game or that it looks the way it does they want to play that natural kingdom hearts like I don't know, game. They want to play that. They want to see it in those natural graphics, those natural, like, environments. They don't want to see, like, chibi characters on, like, a mobile game, no matter how cute the art is. <laughs> I I think that Cage 4, if I had to put a date, I'd say end of next year or the year after. So, I think and any time between end 2024 and early 2026 is the timeline for Kingdom Hearts 3. So, end of next year, 2025 is definitely the year where we're probably going to get like that that might be the release year, so I think I think 2025 is the most likely release year. End of next year at like the earliest, earliest in my opinion. Unless the next trailer just shows, like, a finished game all of a sudden. Because that, that could happen. Like, ne the next Kingdom Hearts trailer could just show, like, the most complete game. Maybe we have a release date or something. But if they do end up doing that, I'm going to be concerned. Because I'm going to be thinking to myself, wow, this Kingdom Hearts game is about to be extremely short. Imagine having a number title that's, like, 12 hours. I feel like that would be really, uh... I don't know. I don't know how I'd feel about that for Kingdom Hearts. Like a number tile that's like less than twenty hours, less than twenty five is a little weird. I feel like most number tiles end up being around twenty to twenty five hours for first playthrough. Uh, and then replaying, of course, you could be you could replay those game skipping cutscenes. Half of that's cutscenes, so the actual gameplay is like ten, twelve. If you're just like playing normally and not speed running or no expert at the game, you're just playing, find most mob fights, also doing a lot of bosses. That sort of thing. After Remake Part 2. I agree. I think... I, I do think K4 will release after 7 Remake Part 2. I think that's the most likely uh, case. When will they start advertising those? My like thought process a little bit. I feel like we might see some stuff at the end of this year. I was kind of banking on the 21st anniversary. But it's looking a lot less likely and it's looking even less likely with e3 being canceled e3 is gone guys we live in the era we we have like lived through a period where e3 was like at its peak like e3 was like the most hype gaming event and that's my brother screaming we lived through a period where e3 was like the most hype gaming event just ever like back-to-back -back kingdom hearts shows at e3 someone actually i feel like most of the most memorable moments for Kingdom Hearts 3's hype cycle happened during E3. Like, think about it. The, from the launch to, like, that E3 2015 show where we first saw young Xehanort and Eric kiss the whole chess game thing. That was the first time we saw that. And then we got a lot of world reveals during E3. Another memorable moment outside of E3 was at D23. And we've had, like, some trailers come out, like, at orchestras and stuff. But, like, I think the most, like, memorable, the craziest moments, like, anti-Aqua, like, Aqua Nor, if you guys remember that during the KH3 hype train, everyone's reactions to seeing Aqua, like, getting norted, even though that wasn't what happened at all. Um, just, there was, I don't know, they all happened at E3. And we're now in an era where, like, E3's gone. E3's gone. So, like, I wonder where Kingdom Hearts would show up. Like, I feel like Kingdom Hearts is usually more, slightly more likely to show up at the E3 than it is, like, other areas. Uh, but, I mean, it's not like there aren't other conventions, but I, I kind of just feel like these other conventions, they don't prioritize Kingdom Hearts. They don't prioritize games like Kingdom Hearts as much. Like, if it comes down to Kingdom Hearts or Final Fantasy, I think most companies are going to probably want that Final Fantasy rub over that Kingdom Hearts rub. Even though Kingdom Hearts has, like, Disney attached to it, it has that mainstream potential, Final Fantasy is just the bread and butter. That, that's just the bread and butter at Square Enix. So, like, I think they're going to always prioritize that when it comes to these bigger showcases. Um, unless a Kingdom Hearts game was just about to come out. Also, the way Kingdom Hearts does, does its advertisement, Kingdom Hearts 3 was a little, like unusual anyways regarding its advertisement i mean we've had a lot of kingdom hearts games get announced years out 
but the bulk of advertisement for Kingdom Hearts games, even three actually, like I would say you'll go a long period of time without getting any Kingdom Hearts news, but then when they do release news, it'll all come at once. So like, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised the next time we see a Kingdom Hearts trailer, it's a trailer, an interview, maybe a snippet of a trailer, maybe a demo, maybe uh, maybe we see someone play a demo, maybe we see live gameplay, but like a, I don't know, one of those 15 minutes of KH3 vid videos or KH4 videos. Uh, they just drop like a ton of stuff at once. Screenshots, just in information on top of information. Like, we didn't really get that even with the announcement of Kingdom Hearts 4. We didn't get that with the announcement of KH3 or a lot of these other Kingdom Hearts games. Like, usually when they drop, um, after like the initial announcements, when they drop a trailer, we get a lot. We get a lot at once. We get a whole lot at once. Think about that E3 in 2018, right before the game came out. We got three, no, four trailers, actually, during that entire E3 season. During just, I believe, May to June, like, end May to June. We got, like, four trailers just within a couple of weeks of each other. Um, and that was an insane time period. That was an absolutely insane time period. Think of... Think of Remind just a little bit, right? Um, now, I'm not going to say we got a bulk of stuff with Remind, but Remind, what, got announced, like, early in, uh, what was it, tw what was it 2020 or 2019? Um, Remind got announced, like, earlier in that year when it would release, like, in April. Um, April or something, right? May, somewhere around there, June. I I'm, I'm missing mixing up the dates, but I know it was, like, somewhere earlier in the halfway point of that year, and we got three shows for Remind. Um, we got the first Remind trailer, we got a small interview. We got the next Remind trailer, I don't think we got anything after that. But then when we got the last Remind trailer, we got a big interview along with a massive trailer. And then the game will come out, or the re the DLC would come out not too long after that. Uh, I don't know, Square Enix just likes to release a lot of their stuff kind of in bulk. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're just, they're just firing up stuff, charging up things to release, and then give us all at once. We're not really obligated to get a bunch of news or anything either, though. Um, I do think when they do decide to drop something, transparency is important. That's something I always lobbied for with Union Cross, Dark Road. But I'm so happy those stories are finished now. I do kind of miss having Kingdom Hearts story to look forward to every, like, couple of months or couple of weeks. However, whenever they decide to release them, because they, they definitely were very inconsistent with updates. Sometimes they would try to do it every month. Other times, they would, like, do it every two months, three months. It was definitely very, like, random and different. But I remember they just would not communicate when, like, Global would receive updates. Like, we would be left there assuming when the Global version would drop. Even with Dark Road, I remember, um, they would eventually release it, like, not too long after, of course. But um, I remember even with, like dark road like there's there a little bit of a communication not there like they, they could have at least said like hey it'll be dropping a couple hours after japan I, I feel like the japan teams for kingdom hearts don't realize how much the u.s like not all not all of them of course like most kingdom hearts fans aren't sitting here looking at news a lot of them rely either on influencers or these news sites and news articles or straight up just they just wait for like a big show to release and that's their kingdom hearts like itch scratch for the next like couple months or year or whenever they release the next trailer but i i think the i think they japan doesn't realize that there even is like a community of people like i would say a decent a decent amount of people like at least like tens of thousands maybe a couple hundred thousand people who like they, they they consumed Union Cross through the Japanese updates because they were so behind for global. Like we, we keep up to date with the interviews. We we try to keep up to date with the interviews. We know when stuff's happening in Japan. It's not like we're not oblivious. Like the world's connected through social media. Like it's not like we don't know what's going on. So that's what makes it a little like eh when like we know what's happening over there and then they just aren't communicating with us at all they even do weird stuff like they'll make us they'll make a tweet specifically for the japanese account and not the american one not the global one and it's just like okay <laughs> it's weird though um but at the end of the day we we got all the story so there's nothing to really be upset about i wouldn't even say i was like super upset just 
a little like annoyed, disappointed because it's like, man, you want you want them to be to communicate with you. Like I see these other companies, they they're pretty good communicating. They're they're pretty decent. Not all of them. There's definitely some that are even worse than Square is, but I feel like communication could just be better sometimes. They could just be a little better. Now, I my hopes, my wishes, my excitement for Kingdom Hearts 4 is not quite where I feel like it could be. So that might be another reason why when I started the podcast, I was kind of like, you know, I'm content with the games I got. And that's because I didn't see that much of Cage 4. I mean, I saw the same thing you guys did. I saw the announcement. But for me, the announcement was, while well, it, it, was, it was a good announcement and all, it wasn't like I guess it wasn't what I was expecting. I didn't know what I was expecting for the announcement. But because it wasn't what I was expecting, I kind of think that's what makes it good to a degree. It's just... I... I realized as I've gotten older, because I guess I've kind of... I've kind of reconnected to what brought me into Kingdom Hearts so much as a kid. And I feel like the reason I've gotten reconnected with this aspect of Cage for me is... I don't know, like, whenever, like, a new Disney movie comes out that I really enjoy, like, Encanto, for example, which I loved, like, I loved so, so much movies like Soul or rewatching movies like Inside Out. I don't know, like, seeing these newer Disney movies that are good come out and release, one of my first thoughts after I finished the movie, on top of how good of a movie it was, is, man, I can't believe I'm a Kingdom Hearts fan. I... There's a possibility that a movie this good can be reimagined or repurposed into Kingdom Hearts. And I'm like, that is actually so amazing. Like, there is a possibility one of my favorite movies in Encanto or Moana can be in Kingdom Hearts. And what I'm elaborating to basically is, I'm basically just saying, like, I love the Disney side of Kingdom Hearts a lot, so I guess seeing not that much Disney in the trailer, like, like, it kind of hurt. Like, I won't say, well, hurt's not the right word. It's, it left me a little confused as to how I felt, because I didn't really know how to internalize what they gave me. Like, I didn't really know what to think, I suppose. Like, Quadratum looked cool, I guess, but I'm, I personally was not that into Sora's new design. I is growing on me. I like it. I like it now. <laughs> I know a lot of people have it as their new favorite already. I, I personally am a bigger fan of the other Sora designs so far, at least. I, I might need to play the game. I might need to see it on version 5, but... I, I guess I just wasn't fully sold on, like, the new stuff in the KH4 trailer. Also, what I did see in the KH4 trailer, it looked very much so, like, scripted gameplay. Like, you know, it, we immediately went into, like, these segments where we were riding on buildings, where we were, like, swinging on poles. So, that's very different to me from actually seeing Sora walk around and hit something with his keyblade, like normal, like doing a normal base combo or something. And it's probably because it's not that far into the game yet to where that sort of stuff looks good enough to show in a trailer. Uh, but all of that combined kind of left me with a taste in my mouth that was just kind of like, huh. Not like this is bad, but just, huh. That was different <laughs> from what I was expecting. Um... But I, I'm sure that, like, they've already, like, told us in interviews. Nomura gave me a lot more comfort in interviews when uh, he did say, because apparently there, I'm not the only one who felt that way, I discovered. There was a lot of people who felt like, wow, there's no Disney in that Cage 4 trailer. Like, did that trailer didn't feel like Kingdom Hearts, really. And he, he had to reassure people in an interview that, there is still Disney in KH4. There is still, you know, worlds and, you know, this is still a Kingdom Hearts game. It's still very much so the Kingdom Hearts you grew up and loved. It's just that, you know, they're going a different route. And that's what I mean when I say we're entering a new era. We're entering an era of Kingdom Hearts where a lot of things are probably about to be very different from what they used to be uh, back in the day. So, like, we, we might not get disney as a priority 
in these games anymore. That that is a possibility. I still think we're going to get Disney Worlds, but they might not be the complete priority. That's a possibility. Um, just the concept of Quadratum and meshing in all this Versus 13 lore into the game is going to make things drastically different from how they used to be. And the more I sit on it, like, the more I think about Kingdom Hearts 4, aside from, like, the trailer, the announcement itself, like, when I look back at it now, I'm, I'm hype. I'm, I'm absolutely, like, excited. I'm, I am anticipating Kingdom Hearts 4, and I do want more news. I can wait, but I do want more. But now with this new era we're entering into, it's it's going to be it is going to be a little different. And I'm excited for this new story. I'm excited to see how Kingdom Hearts once again just changes their formula. It's it's going to, it's going to be unique. Um, but that's going to be all I talk about for this segment of the live stream. The next segment of the live stream is going to be something a little different. I'm going to try to add this into the segments. Uh, apologies if you heard background noise or anything. I have no idea how much or how good my mic picks up the background audio. So I just have to apologize this in case you guys do hear it, which might make you listen out for it more. So it might be counterintuitive to what I'm actually trying to get out of that. But, well, whatever, whatever. Well, move on to the next segment. Anyways, so the next segment of the podcast I'm going to be trying to do at the end of every podcast, we're going to read some questions. Now, uh, the way these questions are going to work uh, in the future, at least, and uh, for today's episode, because this is the first podcast episode, I went to the community tab and I asked people, what questions do you have for the podcast I can put on stream that you guys want to talk about? Um... And a lot of you guys commented some interesting questions. Some of you barely commented questions and commented, like, thoughts. Like, you guys gave me entire paragraphs, which, uh, for future uh, note, I don't mind reading, you know, like, the paragraphs. But try to try to have, like, a, I guess, general question <laughs> in there. Some of you guys would, like, have a question and then, like, put, I don't know, you would have your question mixed in with like the rest of the essay you wrote in the comments. <laughs> like I had some people write like basically their thoughts, like their thesis is in the comments. I'm like, oh, what's the question though? <laughs> Anyways though, uh, let's go ahead and read some of the questions. We only got four, um, but in the future, we're going to do questions via Patreon, via Super Chats, via just well, well, whatever um, on top of Discord, on top of YouTube comments. We're going to try to get questions from all over the community, Twitter as well. Um, but today, we just did questions off of the community tab. So let's get right to it. All right, so what's up, everyone? Uh, so this layout isn't too different from the last one, but uh, there's just a slight little change, so I can put questions up on the screen. So we have the first question from Retrospear. What made you start doing YouTube? I think it's a pretty pretty nice question to start the podcast, and everyone likes to know here and there. Um, so there's a lot of depth to this question because... I feel like my reason for doing YouTube, like there, there's always like something gets added to my reason to doing YouTube every like couple of months. And I hope the music's fine, by the way. I hope it isn't too loud. If it is, let me know. But um, there's always something that gets added to my reason for doing YouTube every couple months, even every year. It's, it's so varied now, admittedly. I, I started YouTube with a very cringe goal, I'd say. Like, I kind of just... When I started the channel, when I was... How old was I? I was 13 when I started this channel. But when I started YouTube in general, I was like 12, 11, when I had the idea of just doing it. So, well over 10 years ago. Um, I don't 
quite remember or know if I wanted this to be like my dream job. I always knew though that I just wanted to do entertainment in general. When I was younger, I always just wanted to be a writer. Uh, like, I guess what you guys kind of, sort of, maybe see <laughs> in like the outro girl, that is a character who I want to be my first writing project, like my first official writing project, obviously separated from Kingdom Hearts and all that stuff, just my first original writing project. Um, I guess that dream has kind of manifested into just general entertainment. Anything I can do to give people something to look forward to every day is basically what my goal is. If I'm doing YouTube for the rest of my life, that ends up being my main source of income, main thing that keeps, you know, the food, main, I don't know, main thing that keeps the food in the fridge, main thing that keeps my, my babies fed, uh, I don't know, keeps the wife out of work, that, that ends up being the main source of income for my life, I'm fine with that, and I don't end up doing writing, like, as a big thing, as of right now, at least, who knows what will change in my mind, but as of right now, I think I'd be fine with that, and that's because, um, I see this as a way of giving people something to look forward to. And that's like, I guess, my motto in my head. That's the thing I always try to keep true to myself on. Just give people something to look forward to. In my content, in whatever I try and do or do or put out there into the world. Uh, what made me do Kingdom Hearts on YouTube is... I simply just like Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> I just love Kingdom Hearts so much, and when it came to doing content, I, I feel like there's no real reason for me to do content if I can't do something that that I think I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get bored of, or that I think I'm gonna like grow tired of, or just exhausted. I I needed to pick something to make content on that I will never get tired of. I truly think I never would get tired of gaming. It's one of those things that, that I love, cherish, like, so deeply that I know, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get bored of, really. I'm, I'm not really going to get bored of playing games. Even if I fall out of, like, certain single-player games, I don't play games as much this year compared to last year. Kingdom Hearts being my favorite franchise, being my favorite game, and that being a constant thing in my life, I think it serves as a good thing to do on YouTube, to make as a constant on the channel. Now, am I going to do Kingdom Hearts forever on YouTube? I don't know. Am I, cont am I fine with doing Kingdom Hearts forever on YouTube? Honestly, probably. Like, I I believe that I, that, shoot, there, there's channels that have proven it. I truly believe that Kingdom Hearts, if you want to do anything on this platform, you could make anything on this platform full time. You just have to figure out how to find your audience. That's what I truly believe. Uh... I don't know. I have a lot of cringy answers for doing YouTube, and it's going to sound just, like, super preachy and, like, cringy and cliche, but that, that's just, those are just my genuine reasons. Uh, obviously, I, I am fine financially tied to YouTube now, too. Like, as I've gotten older, I used to do this at, like, 11, 12, 13. All, throughout all the years of my life, I did this. I, I was doing YouTube in middle school. Um with minecraft i was doing it doing it through most of my high school years uh with kingdom hearts and a little bit of steam universe and dragon ball and i made like nothing I, I i basically didn't start making like any actual significant income on youtube i don't even say significant i didn't start making any actual income till like 2018 and, and in 2018, it would be like maybe like a hundred bucks a month or something maybe 50 bucks a month and that felt so good to me at the time and of course as years went on it, it became more and more and more but like uh we, we are working hard to make it a full-time thing like officially i basically do it full-time but i i do have other things that i try to get income from sponsors definitely help a lot so if you see me spam sponsors and videos or even this podcast it's because your boy's trying to trying to have a roof over his head he, he's trying to pay he's trying to pay that rent that month so it ain't because I, I, I ain't trying to sell out. We just trying to, we just trying to, we just trying to make a living. <laughs> We're trying to live to make the content. Anyways, though, um, is there any more, I, I, is there any more, like, specific questions, I guess? Like, what made you start doing YouTube? Is there any more, like, specifics to that in chat? Since we are live today, uh, 
that you guys want to know about that. Thanks for podcasting Kingdom Hearts. There's not too many public outlets for the Cage series. Public outlets for the Cage series. What do you mean by that? By public outlets? That's an interesting term. Did you just mean podcast in general? Like just for listening to Kingdom Hearts? If so, I'd, I'd probably agree. Like I feel that's the reason I started this podcast. I wanted to do a podcast for Kingdom Hearts because I felt like there weren't that many. Like I've, I definitely have some friends and seen some people do podcasts. I've been guests on podcasts, like the Landy Lodge recently who invited me on his podcast, uh, I think around a month or two ago. And it was a fun time. And I'm just sitting here thinking like, man, I need to do my own. Cause I've been wanting to for like years. Like I, this is not my first rodeo with the podcast. I, I've had a Steven Universe podcast in the past. I've also had my own little like miniature podcast in the past too uh but none of them lasted more than like a couple episodes i think i had this podcast called homeworld podcast you know homeworld from steven universe and uh that was like i don't know that 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 podcast was very fun actually but it didn't last too too long but it was it was definitely a fun time but i hope to make this one a podcast that actually lasts i also have the experience i hope to make it last and to make it be entertaining i know we've kind of we've definitely messed up a couple times this episode in terms of just talking but i hope that i can eventually have like the talking the podcast feel be even more smooth be even more entertaining more anything if you like hearing me talk already then you're used to it but for people who are new listening to this because i know there's gonna be a lot of people who might only watch the podcast because like shoot there's channels i have that for like, there's channels who like where i do not like their regular content but i watch their podcasts i think their podcast is cool so maybe i'll have that sort of fan base here where you only watch my podcast and nothing else on the channel and i'm i'm chill with that i'm perfectly chill with that uh will this be in apple i i don't know um the three main platforms i plan to put this pod podcast on hopefully uh Obviously, YouTube is the main the main place. Spotify is another one, and then Apple, and that's mostly because those are the three biggest platforms for podcasting. I I did the heavy research, and apparently, seventy eight percent of all podcasts are just listened to on YouTube, which is insane to me. That is absolutely insane to me. Seventy eight percent, crazy, 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 crazy. Anyhow. Um, we have <laughs> we have some more questions. We have some more questions. So the next question comes from the Brick Separator on YouTube. If Kingdom Hearts made a crossover world with a franchise other than Disney, what would you want it to be? Crossover world. So uh, this answer is not my permanent answer, and it's not my like. I, I absolutely need this to happen answer like it, this is more so like I think it will be cool answer so I'm, I'm gonna just do some other video games to start off with I think Kingdom Hearts and I mean well Star Wars is Disney now so I guess but um, if if you if you're the Star Wars fan that doesn't consider Star Wars Disney because it started off as as just Lucas films and not Disney um, then Star Wars will be one probably be the biggest one actually uh then you would have genshin impact and octopath and simply because those are probably two of my favorite games um not genshin i don't know where genshin is anymore genshin was a top 10 game for me at one point in my life when i was at my peak playing genshin like maybe a year ago <laughs> probably a year and a half ago uh but nowadays i mean I don't know. Well, anyways, that, that's the whole combo with Genshin. Um, I just think Sora would have a beautiful interaction with some of the Genshin cast, and I think Sora would have amazing interactions with uh, Voice Crack. Would have an amazing interaction with like some of the Octopath characters. Like, I think it would just be really cool. It would be extremely cool to see Sora interact with some of those people. Um, imagine Sora interacting like over it, dude. Like, I still need to play two, so I don't. I'm, I'm not too familiar with the with the Octopath two characters, but either one would fit for me. Either one will fit for me. Um, so yeah, those would be my two go tos, and, and of course, uh, I, I would love to see. I would actually love to see like Kingdom Hearts collab with other animation studios like DreamWorks, Illumination, things like that. That that would be sick to me. Uh, just other 
family friendly type of film similar to Disney but not quite Disney I think would have fit Kingdom Hearts like very nicely now for the next question we have today we have Derek Anderson what are your thoughts on Nomura's comments at the concert a couple weeks later now I knew this was a question so that's why I didn't go too heavy on my thoughts on that earlier I think that, well, for starters, for those of you that don't know what we're even talking about, um, a couple of weeks ago, Nomura uh, said um, that Kingdom Hearts, uh, there was a situation that happened with Kingdom Hearts. I did some research on this, and it potentially had to do with this unforeseen situation that apparently affected Kingdom Hearts' missing link um coming out affected missing link having an account open its own twitter account open which to this day it still doesn't have its own twitter account open people did some other research as well people like the gamers doing people like on twitter other creators um no no also around that time period final fantasy 14 was apparently going through a big like data breach a big leak so like it's very possible that these things all affected kingdom hearts so there's potentially a massive data leak of information files all that stuff um that are potentially hazardous to square enix um and it could have affected kingdom hearts it could have affected more games than just 14 um but we have no full info to fully confirm this but that is possibly the case now aside from that we don't know what Nomura means i'm just gonna have to hope that it doesn't mean anything too serious for kingdom hearts and that the situation is resolved now which it seems like the situation is resolved now now the way we even found out about this is because Nomura would mention don't you know what happened with kingdom hearts to yoko shimamura at a kingdom hearts concert mentioning this crazy situation that happened that he didn't really elaborate on and then he just left everyone worried and kind of just went backstage and it was kind of like why do you do that like it was very odd of him to do that uh but my thoughts on it now i'm just gonna hope it's nothing serious i i don't think it's nothing serious and if it i think it's probably resolved now i'm gonna hope it's resolved now so maybe we'll never know about or maybe we'll just ramble ramble about in an interview another day if he's allowed to uh, so I'm gonna keep moving. I'm gonna keep assuming Kingdom Hearts is fine. I'm gonna keep assuming Disney's still part of Kingdom Hearts. I'm gonna keep assuming that everything's all fine and dandy. I will elaborate even more though in a more scripted uh, manner in an upcoming video soon. I have a video coming up that pertains to a topic that came out of this. A lot of people were saying that, yo, this is awesome. Disney might not be a part of Kingdom Hearts anymore. And I'm like, no, that is not awesome not only because i love disney personally well i love their movies i'm, I'm not i i can't i'm not going to sit here and say i love the corporation disney I, I just like their animated films um but a lot of were like yo disney gone that's awesome lord you know disney owns kingdom hearts and if Kingdom Hearts separated from Disney, that would heavily, heavily affect the franchise. Like, not even just from a world sense. Because people are probably just thinking, oh, no more Disney worlds. That's cool. So we only get Traverse Town, Radiant Garden and stuff. No, that also means no Don and Goofy. That also means no Maleficent and Pete. That also means, like, all those little tiny Disney references and things scattered throughout Traverse Town. King Mickey doesn't exist in the lore anymore. Like, no Mickey, no Mickey chain on the no mickey keychain on the keyblade like imagine the kingdom key without the mickey symbol like can you guys imagine that like that is cursed it is absolutely cursed like anyways that that we're, we'll talk about that another time moving on to the last question that i decided to pick for this little segment uh because i didn't know how long it would be Izunia. If I'm saying your name right, I hope I am. A long time viewer on the channel, by the way. Do you think Sora will have more of a variety of emotions in Kingdom Hearts 4? Or do you think, for the most part, he'll stick to being the happy-go-lucky protagonist? I think Sora has always had a variety of emotions. However, I will agree. It's not... It, at a surface level, Sora is this happy-go-lucky. Uh, but I do think we will see a more 
very side of sore in the future. I, I I definitely think that. I think that's almost guaranteed. Like, this is one of the first times Sora has been without Don and Goofy, aside from Dream Job Distance, of course. But even in Dream Job, he had companions with him. But this time around, it doesn't really seem like Sora's going to have his usual companions or usual archetype of companions with him. He is straight up in danger. He doesn't know where he's at, and he's desperately trying to get back to the world he came from. I think we're going to see a different side of Sora. I think that's why we're seeing this K4 more mature version of Sora's more mature looking version of Sora. Uh, I, I feel like that's the reason like we're in this real world, real city. I think Nomura is going to try his hardest to make it feel as different as possible while also still maintaining that kind of cage feel. So I think Sora's still going to be happy-go-lucky wanting to save the day. But I, I also think that Sora's like, we're going to, Sora's going to be forced into situations that change his, his emotions up. It has to contextually make sense, of course. I'm fine with the way Sora is as of cage 3 as of Remind. But I, I, of course, a little more depth and variety in terms of emotional range does not hurt. We definitely know Haley Joel Osment can definitely do that because if you, Haley Joel Osment is an actor, actor. So like, uh, yeah, he 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 can put in some work. If he has to do like you know a dark Sora, I mean, we have Vanitas. If he has to do like a Sora who's like being a little bit more mature, I guess, or a little bit more like I guess varied with his emotions, he can definitely do that. I I hundred percent think so. Now before we end off the live stream are there any more people who want to ask any questions in the chat uh now the way this is going to work um this is kind of like a thing for the first episode but the way this is going to work i'm just going to pick like two or three questions in the chat to like answer unfortunately they're not going to be on screen for those of you listening or just watching at home but of course i'll be reading out the questions uh so go ahead ask away bring them on in bring them on in i i can't speak I don't know what's going on with me today. Maybe I'm nervous. Am I, like, nervous for doing the podcast? I've live-streamed, like, a thousand times. And <laughs> when we were stumbling over my words, I always stumble over my words, though. So, like, that's not new. I just cut them out in videos. But if you guys uh, want to, go ahead and ask whatever. I'll pick three random ones in the chat. I see you guys are asking questions now. And anyone who does super chat, I, I will, of course, automatically read your, read your question. To a point, though, if you guys, like, start spamming me with them, I'm going to have to... I might have to save a couple, but I think Sora has been showing signs of starting to mature and grow from things. Maybe we'll get to see him reflect on things from the past. Maybe. I I I do think that will happen. I mean, Sora is a very reflective person. Sora's always reflecting on his experiences, his past experiences in Kingdom Hearts games, and he uses them to justify the way he acts on situations today. We see this constantly in Disney Worlds and KH3, interactions with, like, Sora and Anna. We even see it, like, a little bit um, in, like, other games even. We see it in KH2 when he references KH1 events, KH3 when he references KH1 and KH2 events, just things of that nature. What's a weird world you would want? kind of answer that earlier i would say genshin genshin is a weird a weird world that i would want in kingdom hearts for sure not a kingdom hearts question but are you going to get budokai tenkaichi 4 oh yeah oh yeah i'm definitely getting budokai tenkaichi 4 that's going to be a very fun game to play i'm a big dragon ball fan so 100 percent getting that do you think sora will be going on trips with shalitzia and yasora trips what do you mean by trips? Like, are there, like are Yazora and Trelitzia going to Disney World? Like, is that what you're saying? Maybe that would be fun. All right, I'll read. I'll read one more question in the chat. One more. One more. What are my thoughts on the Destiny Island travel tees? That's a good question. That's a question stemming from uh, one of my last videos. I think it has major implications for the future of Cage, but of course I already said that in the video. So for something a little more, you know, thoughtful. I honestly don't know what to think, but in terms of those major implications, it's just the implication that Destiny Islands potentially exist within Quadratum. 
makes you question the role of Destiny Islands in general in the Kingdom Hearts universe. Like, maybe Destiny Islands is a world that's, like, realmless. Maybe, uh, I don't know. Like, it, it's it's so many things. Like, are there, what characters are from Destiny Islands in that universe? Like, it's it, there's just a lot to, like, dissect and really think about for that. And we'll go back over to the main screen as well. Um, yo, thank you so much, Rolandi, for the $3 donation. Thank you for your hard work. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I am trying my best. I'm trying my best to make as many, like, I don't know, good videos as possible. Uh, that, that motto I have of that's giving people something to look forward to, that is truly something I try to stand by whenever I feel myself like straying away from what I'm like normally doing content for like if I get too obsessed with other things or like numbers or like whatever I, I try to remember that that is my goal that is my goal of course I want to be sustainable though but that that is that's the goal I want so I I will continue to work hard and just make the best videos I possibly can in the Kingdom Hearts community because not only because I love Kingdom Hearts so much, but because I also I also think Kingdom Hearts can go like the super far on this platform and I want to take it there. So not that I have to be the one to do it, <laughs> to be honest, but I want to see what I can do. I want to see what I can provide, you know. Anyways, though, that's going to be it for today's podcast, everyone. I wish I had a cool little outro screen, but I guess I'll just put the intro screen up again, which is just the thumbnail. Thank you guys.